Hello, I'm Eve Jackson in Paris. Thanks for your company. Coming up. French cinema has long been accused of shying away from gritty tales of political extremism. Now a new film charts three decades of a skinhead's life in France. We find out why French impressionist painter Edgar Degas stood out from his contemporaries. An au revoir love locks, bonjour Tunisian street art. A new look for Paris's famous Pont des Arts bridge. Well, starting with a film that's causing quite a stir here in France, as well as creating tension on social media and only being released in a limited number of cinemas, the director of Un Français claims premieres were called off due to possible threats from far-right sympathisers. The film is a gritty portrait of a skinhead spanning several elections and key events involving the Front National Party. Thomas Waterhouse has more. It's a film that certainly packs a punch. Spanning a 30-year period, Un Francais tells the story of Marco Lopez, a skinhead who little by little softens from his ultra-violent hardman ways. The idea for the film came from the murder of a young left-wing militant, Clément Méric, who was beaten to death on the streets of Paris in June 2013 by a group of skinheads. When the director learnt of Méric's death on TV, he decided to write a film that would depict the beliefs and actions of extreme right-wing groups. It's a period I know well, because the main character is the same age as me. I grew up in the same neighborhood, in the same suburb. I knew where this could take place, and that was the starting point for my research. Written to show that people can stop being extremist, Un Francais nevertheless doesn't shy away from showing the worst kinds of violence. There was therefore a huge outcry on social media when the film's trailer was first posted online. In light of reaction to the clip, the film's distributors have decided to halve the number of cinemas across France that will show the film. Yes, we're worried. We might only be shown in 60 cinemas and out of those 60, how many will show the film six times a day and how many will just show it once or twice? So yes, we're concerned. We find ourselves in a country where fiction has the right to show reality when it comes to relationship breakups or quarrels among friends, but not when it comes to politics or religion. I find that really worrying. It's already been described as disturbing and frightening. But as the film opens this week, will French cinema goers prove the distributors wrong for being overly cautious? Now, most famous Impressionist painters are known for their luminous landscapes. However, one of the art movement's leading figures, Edgar Degas, never painted outdoors and is best known for his dancers. Now, an exhibition just outside of Paris looks at how his work differed from the other Impressionists, as Luke Schrager reports. It's an age-old debate. Just what constitutes a work of Impressionism? Edgar Degas' contribution to the movement's not in doubt but he had his own unique approach. At the end of the 19th century, his contemporaries preferred working outdoors with natural light. For Degas, though, it was about being inside with artificial light, such as in his work, The Star. He's really interested in the light. You can see it coming onto the stage. It's white, spreading, catching the dancer's leg. And her arms from below, it deforms her face in a way, but also makes her seem to float in the air, as if the light itself was carrying her. Despite shunning the outdoors, Degas did himself paint landscapes. In fact, it's here where the artist appears to diverge most widely from other painters of his time. It becomes even more obvious when works are compared side by side. We're a long way from the Impressionists. In terms of colour alone, these aren't the colours of Impressionism. There are all these earthy tones, and there's this fluid way he uses the pastel. It's not at all the neat little rhythmic dabs of the Impressionists. Degas' work was anything but spontaneous. Much of his efforts went into preparation, like this ballerina from behind, which can also be found in this painting on the far left. He was never satisfied reworking parts of his canvases. Here, he decided to move the feet of dancers. Elsewhere, he shortened a tutu. 
or even removed a character from the scene entirely. While Degas was never at ease with the label Impressionist, he was still just as much in the avant-garde niche as his contemporaries, a moment between the old school and the modern era. Towards the end of his life, his art would become freer still, his canvases dissolving in a riot of colour. And the Impressionism Museum in Giverny, just outside of Paris, is hosting Degas' work until the 19th of July. Has Paris found the key to its Lovelock debacle? Adored by travellers and hated by locals, the famous Lovelock bridges are seeing their final days in the world's romance capital. An estimated 700,000 padlocks were ripped down early this week because of security concerns. They've been replaced with art from a Tunisian street artist called El Seed. It comes from gallerist Mehdi Ben Sheikh, who says it represents the contemporary Ad Arab world. I thought it was brave, and brave to put an Arabic sentence up in Paris. It's not only a language of terrorists, it's a language of a whole people across the world. A people who are very open, with an extremely spiritual dimension, in their religion too. But just as the love locks spark debate, so does El Cid's artwork. It's a cool combination, right, to bring together different types of art, you know, like the classical stuff and more modern, uh, kind of yeah, nitty gritty stuff, you know what I'm talking about? So that, that's kind of a cool combination. Whereas Paris is supposed to be the city of love, and here we have, we've got some horrible drawings on the bridge. <laughs> I think it cheapens the bridge. Although the padlocks weren't nice to look at, the, the idea of the padlocks it was a nice idea, romantic, which I was fell say in it's line. Romantic, romantic. Well, the artwork will be replaced by clear plastic panels before the end of the year. Close to Dordogne, in the southwest of France, lies one of the most important prehistoric sites ever discovered. But since the 60s, few people have been allowed inside the Lascaux caves due to fear of damaging the stunning paintings inside. So, to preserve and promote this precious heritage, the French authorities are building a replica just metres away. Delana de Souza reports. Artists, decorators and restorers are all busy at work. In this immense workshop, they're creating the perfect replica of the Lascaux cave. It's very moving because we're returning to the origins of art. We try and understand the intentions behind what was done, as well as guess which materials were used given what was available. The Lascaux cave is being built in its entirety. The first reproduction done in the 1980s only covered two-thirds of the site. However, the latest one will unveil sections never seen before by the public. Horses, cattle, stags. We also have a wolf hidden. There are plenty of little things which we can discover. Piecing together Lascaux involves putting together 38 of these enormous puzzles, and it will be done here near the original site of the cave. The replica of the prehistoric structure will be half underground, half above ground, giving the visitor the illusion that they're entering a cave. Everything is done to make the experience as close to the original Lascaux cave as possible. People will feel like they're underground, going down into the earth and entering into a cave. Recreating Lascaux involved taking 15,000 photos and making virtual models of the entire structure, while still respecting every crevice. This little grain's about half a centimetre, but you see it's quite precise because the original was really minuscule, barely a single millimetre. Once inside, the atmosphere as well is identical to the original cave. I'd say that in addition to the reproduction itself, it's the feeling one gets being inside. Visitors will really think they're in a cave. Virtual technology will also guide visitors through the prehistoric age, and the completed Lascaux structure is set to open next spring. 
Well, we'll leave you now with an exhibition that's being billed as the show to see in France this summer. It's on at the Fabre Museum in Montpellier and is dedicated to the golden age of painting in Naples. It brings together many of the great 17th century artists and it starts next week and is on until October. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. The Observer's Direct. From Morocco, Europe seems so close and yet so far. Every day, fleeing from poverty and war, hundreds of people try to enter Europe illegally. Many attempt, but many will fail to make the crossing into Spain. These unfortunate would-be emigrants live in dire conditions, surrounded by terror and violence. Along with Cedric, our observer, our reporter gets their story face to face. The Observer's Direct on France 24 and France24.com. Reporters. Mariupol is eastern Ukraine's strategic harbor. The last bastion between the zones controlled by Kiev and the Crimea, annexed by Russia a year ago. Since the ceasefire, the front line has remained in place 10 kilometers from the city. Under constant threat by the separatists, locals are calling for national unity. Ukrainian soldiers, workers, organizers, militia, aid organizations, everyone is preparing for war. But the announced pro-Russian offensive has yet to happen. Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.